and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Welcome to Secrets of Organ Playing podcast number 108. Today is Sunday, August 20th, 2017. And today's guest is an American organist, Matthew Buller, a native of Lake Charles, Louisiana. He is a recent graduate of the Oberlin Conservatory of Music in Oberlin, Ohio. Matthew currently serves as an organist at St. Clement Catholic Church in Lakewood, Ohio, and in September 2017, he will assume the position of Director of Music at the Holy Family Catholic Church in Parma, Ohio. In this conversation, Matthew shares his insights about overcoming his three main challenges, not giving up on a difficult repertoire, managing work and life, and communicating with his team members. Let's go to the show. Thank you so much, uh, Matthew, for joining in this conversation. Um, I'm so delighted that we're connecting through technology and uh, we have a big time difference here, but it doesn't matter because we are sort of imagining we're having a virtual cup of cappuccino and talking about the things that we both love and enjoy. Thank you so much, Matthew, and welcome to the show. And thank you for having me as well. Thank you for, for the invitation above all and allowing me to get my name and my words out to the wider public of organists that, to whom you share this podcast. Thanks, Matthew. It's very interesting to get to know you and, uh, you know, share your experiences with the world. Um, for example, things that you're working on right now, how your practices are going, what's your practice procedures, maybe some challenges you're facing of, uh, in your way towards your goals. Those things will be extremely valuable for people around the world from 89 countries. Okay. So, uh, Matthew, uh, do you remember those early days when somebody introduced you to the world of pipe organ? And uh, obviously, it might have been like love from the uh, first sight, right? Like many people do. Do you remember the story? Could you share with us how you first fell in love with the organ? Well, it was actually before I began my first piano lessons at the age of nine, back in 2002 or 2003. Um, I was in church, just like most of us when we were young kids, and I was taken up to meet the organist afterwards, who, who was also a self-owned, self, uh, self-run self piano teacher. And this piano teacher, whom I had met, also happened to be a good old friend of my grandfather. And so they were, um, they were from the same generation. They went to the same high school. And so we had a good connection there from the start. Now, he was more of a pianist than an organist, because, you know, he was a self-piano teacher for, for many, many years. He's still teaching today. He's up in his mid-80s going on, still alive, still doing his work, and enjoys it much, very, very much. Then three years after that, in 2000 and, uh, 2006, I was at the age of 12, I was recommended by him to go and find an organ teacher. Which I which I immediately did, uh, weeks after I did that, and I was in the sixth grade of junior high school, and I went over to her church. It's a Canadian lady from Calgary, Alberta, who went to Rice University, studied with Clyde Holloway, and got her master's degree with, under his direction. And at that point, she was kind of on the fence and a little bit hesitant about giving me, giving me my first organ lessons because she thought that I wasn't really prepared. I didn't have a strong piano technique enough to, to be able to, to go into the organ world. And uh, weeks after that encounter and that first lesson, she began to see potential growing out of my, out of my possibilities and technique that was growing immensely and very, very rapidly. And that was at the age of 12, turning 13, which is uh, many, many years before uh, your average student begins his organ lessons. Most students begin organ lessons at the age of 14 or the age of 15, 
whereas I began at the age of 12. But that's because I was really motivated and driven towards the goal of becoming an organist. And it still be, retains my number one passion here now, 11 years later. Right. So that was, that was the first encounter. Do you remember what was the first uh, organ uh, that you encountered? What type of the organ? Yeah. Uh, it was an organ by Otto Hoffmann. Okay. It was a small neoclassical instrument and a, a terrible acoustic. It was an, um, I'm, I'm Roman Catholic, and I was there on a Friday evening for Stations of the Cross at this, this um, very modernist-looking church that's very square-like, and somehow they, they managed to put an organ in there. And Otto Hoffman was not allowed to put the organ in where he thought would be the best place for the organ to speak the best because of uh, demands from the pastor who said, no, I want the organ at this location and it ruined the instrument. But that was what I thought an instrument was at that point. I thought that was the best organ I ever saw, which of course became gradually, mm, I, I changed my mind on that shortly thereafter <laughs> coming across the other instruments. But that was, that's what I thought was, the instrument right uh, and uh, what was the first piece that you played maybe first hymn or maybe first organ composition that you played do you remember this initial music? that that i do not remember i do remember that i was always driven towards playing for church i always loved church music church music and church hymn playing and you know just church music in general now my generation of uh church musicians had to face a big challenge of course because of the contemporary um uh, contemporary realm overtaking church music at that point in the late 90s the whole 90s early 2000s generation right there they were overrun by this contemporary pop culture overtaking him singing and so i was sort of fallen into the trap of thinking that the contemporary songs is catholic church music which it turns out it's not it's far from of course but That stuff, I, of course, trained as a pianist before that, I, because that's mostly piano music. It wasn't a problem. Now, as far as hymns, I had gotten around to hymn playing when I was about 13 and turning 14. And I saw that this works much, much better on the organ, of course, as, as it does. So um, I can't remember what hymn it was. I know I had a lot of favorites of hymns in those days, and I like praise the Lord. Last ones are Freud, Heifredol, and the things like that, of course. They still remain very popular for this day. Of course, I've improvised uh, harmonizations on those and pretty much both moods on those and whatever else has come to my fancy. But those were probably the first that I did. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was like a classical, classical church repertoire, right? Classical mm-hmm. hymns. Across denominations, people sing that in, in all denominations, I think, in this country, right? Wonderful. And um, what happened next? Uh, I know you are a student at Oberlin now, right? Mm-hmm. And well, how did you become interested into organist profession, right? You, choose, you chose Pipe Organ as, as your future goal, probably. How did this happen? Off. Well, it was like that from the very beginning, you see. Mm-hmm. I tell you that um, from the age of 13, I knew that this is what I wanted to do for, for a living. So church music and then concert music came a few years later at about the age of 16. Um, I didn't start taking repertory seriously really until I was uh, 17 years old. Um, and of course, that was five years after I began organ lessons, which I was in a... Um, in a sort of a bad period from the age of 14 through the age, I'm sorry, through the age of 15 through the age of 17, when I wasn't mm-hmm. taking church music and concert repertory very seriously, I was just doing whatever I wanted to do. And I was sort of at a down, down period. But then whenever I turned 18, that had resurrected when I started getting into research and started, you know, experimenting with historic styles, historic repertory, widening my horizons for things, learning about historic organs, and getting out a lot more and performing a lot more at that point. And once I started to do that, once I started performing a fair amount more than I was when I was 17, um, 
um, that helped me secure what I wanted to do as being an organist profession. Especially whenever I was 17, I went to my first pipe organ encounter in Boston, Massachusetts. I made the mistake of going to the advanced one. Mm-hmm. I, say, I say a mistake because it was a wide, it was an eye widening experience, you know, meet, meeting a lot of great people who are still good friends of mine, and some of them I went to school with whom I went to school. But that was the first time that I was really blasted in the face about what have you been doing for the past several years? You know, look at all these people playing thick repertory at the age of 16 and the age of 17. I'm just playing trash, you know? And so whenever I turned 18, after that experience, I immediately started taking repertory more seriously, practicing more hours in a day, you know, taking on a new church job where I tried an organ because in my first church job, we only had a piano. Mm-hmm. So I, I changed church jobs, went back to the cathedral and started doing Saturday vigils for them and then taking on my first Anglican church job, which was more serious in playing and exploiting good repertory. And that led into my experience at Oberlin when I began with my bachelor's in the age, at the age of 19 in 2012. And that's since carried across. Repertory has gotten better. Techniques gotten better. Seriousness about styles have gotten better. Widening horizons, of course, right. until I just graduated with my master's uh, this past May. And that was a good experience because five years really made a big mark in what I do. And now I teach part-time and I still play in church. I've now advanced to a music director position and I'm going back in the full still at Old Orleans to do my artist diploma for another two years. And so that was a very good move I thought to make was to give me more chance to learn bigger repertory because of course your master's and I think doctorate for you is a very intensive writing period, not so much about performing repertory. So yeah. I really wanted to, to, to be um, a performer and so I said, the only way I can do that is to go get the artist diploma. So I forewent my doctorate studies to go and become, to study more advanced repertory, give me more chance to practice, to tackle more work, and to widen my horizons and things I want to do rather than things people are telling me to do. Wonderful. What kind of repertoire uh, were you interested uh, the most at the time? At which point? When you started, uh, let's say, after after uh, pipe organ encounters advanced, you decided, you suddenly understood that, oh, there is a wide world of organ repertoire, right? And uh, what did you start to to study at that point right away? Uh, That's a very good point. Um, I was mostly calling to French romantic music. Of course, you know, the German, Germanic repertory was very prominent. Of course, the German Baroque, the German Renaissance, I was very, very cold to that stuff. And then I discovered French, uh, French Baroque, French classical music, you know, from the mm-hmm. 17th century. And then I widened horizons further to get into the Germanic, Germanic uh, Romantic, German Romantic repertory. It's a yeah. 19th century, early 20th century. But I still wasn't very open to 20th century modern stuff until, until I got into Oberlin. Um, I was mostly playing, of course, Jan Sebastian Bach, like most students would play in French or Romantic repertory. Um, I was performed my first organ symphony whenever I was 18, shortly before I came to Oberlin. It's Vidor 5, of all mm-hmm. things to perform when you're 18. And I'd also like Louis Vian, but I never, I never performed his music until I got to Oberlin. And I was... I was also beginning my French classical repertory. So I could have mm-hmm. some of that before I came to Oberlin as well. And whenever I started at Oberlin, I was already miles ahead of some of the other students who were, who were performing lighter pieces and uh, smaller stuff. I was performing like Toccata and Fugue in F major okay. uh, of, of Bach and then other things. I forget what else I brought. I was like E major crawl, César Franck and mm-hmm. Longley and a lot of French classical repertory, like Marchand, uh, Nicolas de Grigny, and other mm-hmm. composers like that. But those were among the first ones that, to whom I have really got ex- exploited and opened up. And then uh, over the five years, just 
miraculously open up to other things. Uh, much of the things now I've performed, like Lego Coa Fantasies, I've performed two of them, from the Vienna Symphony, two more Vidor Symphonies, and whole collections of French French Baroque repertory and tons of preludes and fugues and crop preludes, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a very wide uh, repertoire, wide range, right? You you sort of start studying uh, uh, from from Bach, and you go, you expand either way in all sorts of directions, right? You go forward, backward, right, left, anywhere, right? And uh, this way, you you get a feel of the immense. Uh, basically uh, treasury of organ music across the ages of 7th century, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so Matthew, who is your professor or was your professor at Oberlin? And Uh, so was uh, James David Christie. Christie, okay. Yes. So, how would you describe his teaching style? Well, he's very much into, you have to, you have to know your, you have to know your notes before you walk into the door. And lessons are all about interpretation. He's very rigorous about historical styles, especially the Germanic Baroque, German Baroque, mm-hmm. especially the Renaissance too. He's very much, um, his one of his strengths is actually Sveling, uh, Scheidemann, Scheidt, Buchstuder, Bruns, and all of that school. He's very, he's very called to, to that repertory, and that's the stuff he teaches the best. Mm-hmm. Um, he is very, strict about um, mastering like beat emphasis uh, non-equalization of beats um, mm-hmm. bringing out historical performances in terms of crawl preludes you know, understanding the text before you start playing the piece and performing things in sort of not I guess to say that he doesn't want you to play like a 20th century organist so to speak, you know, he wants you to think critically about what you're actually playing and what sort of resemblances come from other genres that influence the composer to write in this particular way. Of course, we know that many organists back in that time were also harpsichordists and many of them were also violinists. So they exploited that, those styles into their composition. And once you understand how those instruments behave, it really influences how you perform this repertory and it's greatly influenced how I, how I view all of this music as well. The same thing with romantic music, you know, mm-hmm. thanks to my piano technique and understanding of how, and thanks also to recordings because we know how romantic composers performed. We have, we have recordings so we can get a little bit into that as well. Romantic was my strongest, mm-hmm. but it was professor Christie's weakest. So we we kind of went against each other in that way. We kind of fed fed each other with sorts of things like that. Yeah. It's good when you have this dialogue, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. You exchange ideas with one one another and you grow uh, from each other's ideas and share those things. It's very generous, I think, from your perspective and from your professor's, James David Christie's professor uh, perspectives. I think um, to do this kind of collaboration, right? Uh, artistic collaboration, exchange of uh, ideas. Now, Matthew, um, of course, Oberlin is blessed to have, uh, you know, a wide range of organs in, stylistically on campus. And I hope uh, that you as a student are allowed to touch and play and practice and perform on those. So, uh, Matthew, what is your favorite organ on Oberlin's campus? You know, I'm, I'm actually very happy that you brought this up because I'm sure a lot of students and a lot of organists out there don't really know about this. I mean, many major figures would, but this is one of the big features that attracts people to Oberlin. Um, just to remind people out there, we have the French Romantic modern Fisk organ in Finney Chapel. We have the mighty North German and high Dutch style instrument in Warner Concert Hall. The, like the turn of the 17th, 18th century. That's and then we have the Renaissance instrument in Fairchild Chapel. We also have um, sort of American German romantic instrument inspired in First Church of Oberlin. And then we have the Zibbermann style instrument in Peace Community Church. And then we have a range of other instruments. We have about 14 practice instruments 
And then we have access to a bunch of other instruments. We have about three or four instruments in storage. And just this year, we announced that we are going to acquire a Spanish instrument with three sets of shamads. And of course, the one, one keyboard with divided registers. And we're also acquiring a, a major positive organ. Now, for me to pick one of those instruments to label as my favorite is really hard to do because I've performed all of them in uh-huh. different ways. You know, I've, I've done recitals in every one of the, every one of those concert instruments, one point or another. You know, I gave my junior recital in Warner Concert Hall. I gave my senior recital in Finney Chapel. I gave my master's recital in Fairchild and Peace Church. And I gave my lecture recital for my master's thesis at First Church in Oberlin. So I've performed all of them on all of them. But I have to say, in agreement with, with many other students, that Fairchild Chapel is the greatest on campus. And in fact, it's one of the greatest in the world because of what it does. It has the very pure voicing of a Renaissance instrument with the purity of vocality with the, um, the principles. The mixture isn't overbearing, but it does what it's supposed to do, which is to fill out the ensemble. The trompeta is very full, sounding like, just like a Germanic trumpet. We also have the split sharps to uh, mm-hmm. distinguish the tone between the D sharp and the E flat, for example. We have that all throughout the keyboard. And what's very special about this instrument is that it gives you the opportunity to learn about the restrictions that these composers had, you know, and how fast or slow you have to play this repertory, which greatly enhances how you take it to other instruments. And so I think for all the benefits that that instrument has had, especially upon my understanding of this repertory, I have to say that that one has done the most to me, influenced me mm-hmm. more so than like Finney Chapel, because Finney Chapel has the Pierre de Combinaison above the pedal board, just like a French French romantic instrument. And that one has taken, taken me, but I've been, I've been knowing about that stuff since high school. You know, mm-hmm. I was playing with Peter de Combinaison since I walked in Oberlin. But Fairchild Chapel has been, the, has been the greatest influence on me, so I have to say that that was probably number one. And you, you're talking, just to clarify, Matthew, you're talking about the Renaissance-style organ built by John Brombo, right? John Brombo, yes. Mm-hmm. Wonderful instrument. I remember playing this um, many, many years ago at one of the Oberlin conferences there. Uh, I was a student at, uh, together with my wife, Aushra, at Eastern Michigan University with okay. Pamela Walter Finstra, and uh, together with her entire studio, or at least a few, a few of her students, we went to Oberlin Conference, and we experienced and played on campus, this Finney Chapel also, and uh, of course, uh, what stood out was this organ had, uh, you know, two types of of keyboard layout, you could play the French layout and, and an American, right? You mm-hmm. could have the Grand Orc on the first manual or on the on the second no. manual. No, that's not true. It's mechanical that's action. True. It's mechanical mm-hmm. action. So you can't you can't transfer the manuals. But, but, but just, just to clarify, what you're talking about is the change of performance matter of combination action. So in American mode, it enables you to perform with pistons. And the French mode allows you to perform the Peter de Combinaison, just like the Cavalier Cole style. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. And you have this Dutch, um, Dutch uh, 17th century organ built by, by I think, Flintrop, right? Flintrop. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful instrument in this concept hall, right? Mm-hmm. It does very... The acoustic is perfect for that instrument. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. just to give people some information. It's three manuals. Uh, there's no 32 foot. There are, it was built in 1974, redone in 1988 by Taylor Moody, who, read, who rebuilt the reeds because Flintorp didn't build very, uh, very well constructed reeds for, for, for this style of instrument. Taylor Moody did more research into the Germanic construction of reeds and they went back and re- rebuilt them. Um, there are, I don't even know how many ranks this instrument has, but there are two mixtures in the Haupt. There's the 16, there are the two 16 foot, as you would expect on the Hauptwerk, the principal and the trompet. And then there's uh, the root positive, and then there's the Oberwerk. 
And then there's the, uh, the Hamburger style pedal towers on the side. So it's very much north, it looks north German, but there, there are some Dutch elements about it as well. Just for example, the, the strong, uh, sesquialter registrations on the root positive are very much influenced by the Dutch style. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wonderful, Matthew. So with, with this kind of uh, uh, treasury of instruments on campus, on campus, you can really equip yourself uh, with the best in the world, right? Uh, uh, instruments, basically, and learn a- any t- type of uh, organ technique you want, right? Any type of uh, organ type of comp- composition, uh, right? And be prepared for any challenge you might encounter later right. in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been a great, great benefit to do so. I really mm-hmm. um, admire all the people who helped me get into organ in the first place. You know, if it wasn't for the Organ Academy in 2012, the Organ Summer Academy for high school organists, I wouldn't be at organ. You see? Yes. So what are you um, What are you up to now? I know you are in... Um, uh, music director, right? Uh, can you clarify a little bit where you work and uh, what do you do now? Uh, so for the past five years, I was just holding an assistant position at a church in Lakewood. And now I've just um, been hired on staff to take on the position of director of music at another church down in, in the, one of the Cleveland suburbs of Parma, Ohio. Mm-hmm. The, music, the role of the music director in America is that he oversees the planning of all the music for the choir and for himself for before and after the, after the services, because I work at a Catholic church. This, this one has five weekend masses. We have two on Saturday and three on Sunday. My role is also um, encompass for um, several days during the week, being in an office, you know, filling office duties and, playing for other events during the week, such as funerals, weddings, and also doing a little bit with the, the parochial school that's attached to the church. And what else do I do? Um, I also, in this church, I have to organize seasonal concerts, which mm-hmm. happen maybe twice or three times a year with the choir to promote the choir and promote fundraisings. That's just one of the, that's just one of the ways to do it, and it's really nice that, that the choir wants to do this. It also gives me an opportunity to 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 organize and plan for concerts with more than just myself. You see, because we're used to planning our own concerts, and then now this gives me opportunity to plan for an ensemble of musicians. So that's good, and then I also have to oversee convincing other choirs, such as a kids choir maybe a bell choir in the, in the future, and then also building up the repertory of the current choir. Right. That's, that's a very comprehensive position, right? You, you sort of, a, it's, it's, it's a correct name, director of music. You oversee entire cultural life of, of this church, right? Musical life of this congregation. Um, what, what would you say are number three or uh, three the most difficult challenges that you have to overcome each week in your work for each week huh? well it's just trying not to give up when when repertory gets too difficult to learn you see mm-hmm. i'm sure i'm sure we, we've all had this thing we want to be very ambitious with our repertory choices and then one once uh, we get a, at a certain point during down the road we begin to realize yeah this piece might be too difficult i don't know if this is the right thing for me to do that sort of thing number two is managing is, is managing life between home and work because you okay. see I'm, I'm not married I'm still single and I have to take care of my house uh, which still needs a little bit of work on top of be, being a professional musician so okay. juxtaposing, juxtaposing the two is sometimes a little bit difficult and can make me a little bit depressed from time to time that I don't get to practice as much as I want uh-huh. And number three is, man- is managing communication between my contacts. I'm not the most gregarious person. I'm a little bit shy from time to time, and I'm not a very talkative person. And for me to open up and meet new people and to maintain contacts 
can be very difficult from time to time because I feel like every time I talk to somebody, I want to have something new to talk about, which doesn't always happen. So sometimes conversations can be a little bit dull, a little bit uneventful. And so that's greatly affected me during my career as well. So it's, you know, those are the three biggest that I faced. Maybe there are more that I haven't told you about, but. Wonderful. Those are very, very interesting challenges. And uh, over the two and uh, two years that I've been doing this, this series series of podcasts, all kinds of challenges, uh, uh, our guests, uh, guests shared with us. And, but, but this first is very interesting, not to give up on a difficult repertoire, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you are probably the first who mentioned this because usually people say finding time for practice, right? Or, uh, or finding recital opportunities, right? But this number one is really, really uh, thoughtful, I think, not to give up on a difficult repertoire. Am I right, Matthew, that, uh, that when you pick it... Uh, uh, organ composition, let's say, sometimes you feel stuck, right? And mm-hmm. you want to uh, throw everything away and start practicing a, a, an easier type of music. Sure. Am I right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that can happen. Sometimes you become a little bit too attached and devoted to a piece. Yes, that, that definitely happens. So but, how, did you, how did you, Matthew, um, uh, over, overcame recently this challenge? What was the, the difficult piece that you've had to stick with and, uh, and uh, master and uh, with your will, basically, persevere? Uh, well, there are many. But just to, just to pull, I'm going to pull two out of the hat just to give two different examples. Yeah. One was the uh, BWV 548, the Prelude of Human E minor, the wedge, one of the most yeah. one of the most difficult to perform, of course, of, mm-hmm. of box output. That fugue was very difficult to overcome, the, to, 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 to master, I should say. There were a lot of there were a number of challenges, and I didn't think that I would have it ready for my master's recital. But and so I started buckling down. That was the only thing I practiced for like a few weeks until I mastered several things. And then I started bringing everything back. And then the problems popped up again. So, you know, that, that's just one of the things about, about a piece like that. And also the same thing with the F major, you know, back when I was a freshman. That thing has a number of surprises that keep cropping up from time to time. Yes. That no matter how much you practice it, it's still very difficult. So that, that E minor was, was a big, big challenge that, that I undertook with only uh, seven months to practice to learn it for a number of recitals, including my master's recital. Another, another piece is the Frank Martin Passacaglia. Now, that piece has a, has a number, number of challenges because of its intense chromaticism, and he keeps turning the corner in terms of tonality. He transposes yeah. the, the Passacaglia subject, and then he, um, he combines accidentals sometimes and mixes everything up, makes it sound like a, um, like a whirlwind in your, in your ear, you get lost in the harmonic area, the harmonic field. And so sometimes what you, what you master the day before is not the same thing. It does, doesn't sound the same the very next day. So you're always fighting back and forth and everything. It's been continuous. And, I mean, it took me, I don't know, three weeks to master the first four pages to get used to that harmonic feel, you know. It's really tricky because, yes, uh when you practice and you know the right method, right, to, to learn the new type of episode, then you have to remember the old episode, right, and refresh your memory a few times. And it's daily battle with yourself and music and instrument. Um, do, you, do, you, do you see yourself uh, as, as, as a fighter, basically, uh, fighting this new repertoire, or do you deal with it in a friendly way? I try to do, I try try to deal with it friendly, but sometimes it it can turn into a fight. <laughs> it depends on the piece. <laughs> depends on the piece. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. So I, I hope you will continue not to give in, give up on a difficult uh, repertoire. And uh, obviously, when you do this for a long period of time, for a number of years, certain things uh, become easier, right? 
uh, and you 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 get stuck on on even higher level maybe right Absolutely. for example right now bwv 548 is difficult for you but maybe five years from now when you repeat this piece it will not be as challenging right no, it won't be as challenging yeah and then you face new challenges Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So number two, managing your life and work, basically, uh, work and life balance, basically. That's what we're talking here, right? Yes. And that, that sort of ties in w- with one other thing that you were talking about that many other people say is finding practice time. That's a, that falls into this category as managing life and work. You know, mm-hmm. Do I have time today to practice or what else do I have to do today to accomplish that that's more important than uh, f- finishing up a piece that I was learning yesterday, that kind of thing. Do you have a favorite time of the day to practice usually? I would say the early afternoon because that's okay. whenever I'm the most alert and that's when I'm most attentive to making mistakes. I, I can, I can um, remember things easier at that point. So from, let's say, 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock to about 15 o'clock, those are my best hours to practice. Uh uh, 13 o'clock is when I'm the most alert, and 14 o'clock is is that way as well. After 15, after about 16 o'clock, that's that's when my attention starts to fade out. I usually get back to doing other things. Sometimes I'll practice in the evening around 19 or 20, something like that. But that almost doesn't happen. Right. But it's difficult, right, to, to practice for a long period of time because you have to stay alert and your your body uh, sometimes hurts. Do you take frequent breaks, Matthew? Yes. Mm-hmm. Most, people, most people do. And whenever I was learning a ton of repertory, when I was practicing maybe seven hours a day whenever I was... Uh, 21, 2021, um, I would practice for about 50 minutes and take about a 10 minute break, a walk around the school, go to the restroom, or do, or get a drink of water, do that for every three hour chunk of time that I was doing three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. And I would do that. And it really helped, you know, w- with focus and attention. Exactly. Yeah. People say that, we only can focus really for for maybe half an hour or 25 minutes and you know this this uh, famous pomodoro technique when when you have this timer set for 25 minutes you do a concentrated task and then the timer beeps and you have a 5 minute rest and then you can practice or do something very focused uh, for more of uh, 25 minutes Right, and then you rest again, and then you can do this for a number of chunks of time, very yes. successfully. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So I hope I hope with your busy schedule, being director of music, you can still find your uh, time to practice each day or almost every day, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, you'll continue to get better as an organist, right? Yes, absolutely. Although I can. I can understand that being director of music involves a lot of things not necessarily directly related to practice, right? You, right. you manage your choirs, you manage your, your, your people, basically your team, and um, you over, oversee them, how they work, coordinate. Mm-hmm. But then you are not working yourself, right, on your things. Well, I am from time to time, yes. I mean, I would of course, devote some time because I'll be, because that's 40 hours, 40 hours a week is full time, 40 hours on site, mm-hmm. which means that, that I would also be able to practice from just some of that time during the day. You know, it's, if I go, if I, if I go a day without practice, I, I feel like I've wasted a day. Mm-hmm. Something's missing. That's right. Mm-hmm. Something's missing. Wonderful. And the last challenge that you mentioned is managing communication between your your team, right? Basically, um, uh, how it is challenging for you, and uh, and why? Well, there are some people who like 
uh, infrequent communication. There are some people that, that don't like to talk very much or you only go to them whenever you need to for a problem or something or, oh, I want to do this now, that sort of thing. But there are other people with whom I come into contact who see me as sort of a, an uninteresting person, somebody you don't want to, somebody you can't hang around with for maybe more than an hour and a half, two hours at a time or some, that kind of thing. Or some people who see me as, well, he's only good if we need him to do something f- for this particular occasion or right now or whatever. Um, for me, that was a difficult obstacle to overcome because it sort of discourages me from immersing myself and becoming a little bit more open to other people. And that, well, if these people are saying that, then what are these people going to say? You know, that sort of thing. So it sort of discourages me from, from opening up to another team of people and making contacts with that sort of guilt on your shoulder can, can be very difficult and it can affect one's career. And especially, hopefully that doesn't, uh, um, that doesn't keep up much longer. Hopefully that'll um, eradicate itself and that way oh, I can just get over it and move on from the so, Matthew, going forward, do you have a, a vision for your five years uh, plan, for example? What would you like to do in five years from now? In five years from now, well, the ultimate job for me is a you know, major Catholic cathedral or major Protestant church. You see, being a full-time church musician at a major institution was is really what I want to do and it's in, in addition to doing maybe a small university job and also leading a concert career. Uh, about five years time, maybe about half of those will be realized, but I hope that at least, at least 60% of those, for example, hopefully a major church job, maybe a small teaching position and hopefully starting, starting a concert career. The concert career one is not really my prime focus at the moment, the other, the, but the other two are. So I hope mm-hmm. that those will lead me down the path to starting a, a well-prospered career that will take me to enjoying what I most enjoy doing. You know. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So uh, Matthew, do you remember this time when you first started playing the organ? And if you, if in your mind you could go back in time and uh, tell. Number one advice, number one tip, what would be this number one tip to your former self be? Hmm. It's very interesting. It's probably you're doing, you're doing this thing that you want to do and take it seriously and don't mess around as much, as much as you're trying to do now, you know, because that's the way I was whenever I was, in my earliest uh, rudimentary years of learning organ. And, you know, maybe go back to one of I was 15 years old and say, well, what are you doing? You know, you got to get to this goal. And wh- what are you doing now to, to get to that ultimate accomplishment? You know, you might as well just stop, get, stop um, watching TV all the time or mm-hmm. not, doing, not doing your tasks that you need to do you might want to take your work a little bit more seriously, you know. Be more focused, right, about your vision and your goals. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great, because we only live once, right, and life is really short. Mm -hmm. But at that time when you you are like 15, 16, or 17, we don't understand that. We think, oh, entire age is uh, in front of us, right? Uh, we, li- we live forever. I mean, other people will die, but not us, right? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. That's a great advice, by the way, to, 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 to be very focused in your, in your efforts and not, not mess around, right? And, and really, really strive for the goal, whatever it, it might be in your organ playing career. A lot of people will benefit from this. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you for having me. 
Really and uh, before we close, of course, people would like to know uh, more about you, your work. So could you direct our listeners to some place online where they could give you feedback and say hello and find out more about you? Okay, well, you can find me. My two prime hotspots are Facebook and LinkedIn. I would encourage people to go just type in my name, Matthew Buller, on Facebook. You'll find you'll find a picture of me sitting at the organ of Naumburg in the Vinzelskirche, which is the organ that Bach praised. And then uh, on my LinkedIn account, you can you can also type in my name, and you'll find me seated at the organ of Brick Church, Brick Presbyterian Church in New York City. And you'll see all of my things listed out over there. I've listed all of my my um, my jobs, my awards, whatever else I have in terms of abilities and feel free to post on my wall, you know, just add me as a friend and then post on a post on my wall. You know, it's like great to meet you and, uh, or send me a message on either platform, uh, just expressing interest to communicate with me further and say, I would like to um, have more experience in X, Y, Z or whatever else you see. Wonderful. I'll make sure to add those links to Facebook and LinkedIn to our conversation uh, online and people could literally click and visit your profiles uh, on Facebook and LinkedIn directly. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Matthew, for this very thoughtful and insightful uh, conversation. I hope people will feel inspired not to give up on a difficult repertoire, just like you are suggesting. And people who are, let's say, uh, managing busy schedules as church musicians uh, will f- try to find uh, uh, time for practice each day and basically manage uh, life and work better, mm-hmm. just like you are trying to do every day and of course if if they have a team of musicians working with them right maybe they could uh, benefit from communicating mm-hmm. communicating better with them yes all right so great. keep up your great work be generous and share your work that's the most important thing in today's world i think and uh, let's keep connected and uh, uh, stay in touch yes Thank you for having me once again. Thank you. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog, Secrets of Organ Playing, at organduo.lt, where you will find lots of insights, practical advice, and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vidas Pinkavitus. Thanks for listening. And I'll catch you online really soon.